Hello, my name is Dr. Gordon Edwards. I'm the president of the Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility, and this is Nuclear Waste 101, an introduction to the variety of radioactive waste materials created by nuclear power plants. Every nuclear reactor creates hundreds of new radioactive elements as waste byproducts. The vast majority of these materials were never found in nature before 1940. They are the result of nuclear fission. These wastes are relatively small in volume, but they are enormously toxic and virtually indestructible. The word nuclear refers to the nucleus of an atom, one of the tiniest objects in the world, but held together by the strongest forces known to science. When this nuclear energy is unleashed, as in a nuclear explosion, the consequences are mind-blowing and earth-shattering. In a nuclear power plant, nuclear energy is used just to boil water. The steam spins a turbine and generates electricity. The radioactive waste is created in the core of the reactor, which is where the fuel is. Most of it is inside the solid fuel, but the entire core area becomes extremely radioactive. None of the materials in the core can ever be recycled, but must be treated as long-lived radioactive waste. The nuclear industry ad that you see here is called Small Wonder. And it's talk, talking about how amazing it is that this tiny uranium fuel pellet can deliver as much energy as a carload of coal and yet give off no carbon dioxide. These are the two greatest attractions of nuclear power. The sheer concentration of energy with the added bonus that no greenhouse gas emissions occur. But what they don't tell you in the ad is that once you use this pellet to get energy, you can't just throw it away. You have to keep your eye on it for the next 10 million years. If even one of these fuel assemblies had been used in a nuclear reactor, this man would be dead. The used fuel is millions of times more radioactive than the fresh fuel. One used fuel assembly fresh out of the reactor will kill any human being at a distance of one meter in just a few seconds because of a blast of gamma radiation. This used fuel will never be handled by human hands again. The fundamental fact about radioactivity is that it is a form of nuclear energy that cannot be shut off by any method known to science. That's why we have a radioactive waste problem. Immediately after a nuclear reactor is completely shut down, the radioactive waste inside continues to generate enough heat to melt the core of the reactor at a temperature of more than 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit if no cooling is available. That's what happened at Fukushima. That's what happened at Chernobyl. So what is radioactivity? Well, it's not a thing. It's a property of certain materials whose atoms have an unstable nucleus. A radioactive nucleus or radionuclide is like a tiny little time bomb. It will explode suddenly and violently, giving off one or two projectiles like subatomic shrapnel. These projectiles are called alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma rays, and they are damaging to living cells and even non-living material. Collectively, they're called atomic radiation. Radiation randomly breaks molecules, including DNA molecules. Radioactive emissions cannot be seen or smelled or tasted or felt. Here, in a special device called a cloud chamber, the tracks of all these radioactive emissions can be seen. The rock that you see in the picture is a lump of uranium ore. Even with special equipment, some types of atomic radiation like alpha rays can be extremely difficult to detect. Here in Canada, workers have unknowingly carried radioactive contamination into their homes from nuclear power plants. The radioactive elements created inside a nuclear reactor all have different pathways through the environment and through the human body. Radioactive iodine goes to the thyroid gland and causes thyroid cancer. 5,000 children in Belarus had to have their thyroid glands surgically removed after Chernobyl. Radioactive cesium goes to the muscle tissue and the blood, making meat unfit for human consumption. Radioactive strontium goes to the bones, the teeth, and mother's milk, causing bone cancer and blood diseases like leukemia. And there are many, many more of these radioactive materials, all different. 
Decades of scientific study have demonstrated that chronic exposure to low levels of radioactivity can cause many delayed health effects that often show up years or even decades after exposure, such as cancer, genetic defects, and cardiovascular damage. The US National Academy of Sciences has published seven reports on the medical effects of radiation exposure and have concluded in every one of those reports that there is no safe level of exposure. The question remains, where do all these radioactive materials come from? The answer is they all come from the nuclear fission process. The, the energy of the nucleus is harnessed by splitting uranium atoms. Uranium is the only material found in nature that can be used to make an atomic bomb or to fuel a nuclear reactor. When a neutron strikes a fissile uranium nucleus, that nucleus splits into two large chunks and then nuclear energy is released. The broken pieces of uranium atoms are called fission products. They form highly unstable new atoms that are extremely radioactive. They're not really wanted, but they're a byproduct of the process. There are hundreds of varieties of fission products, including the radioactive cesium, iodine, and strontium that I mentioned a little while ago, and many, many others. Fission products are the major radioactive constituent of high-level nuclear waste. That is, the used nuclear fuel. Two or three extra neutrons are also given off during fission. That keeps the chain reaction going by splitting more atoms and multiplying the energy output. Those extra neutrons also go on to create two more families of radioactive waste byproducts the family of plutonium and the other transuranic elements, and the uh, often called actinides, and the family of neutron activation products. Nuclear reactors can be shut off, but radioactivity cannot be shut off. The fission products continue to generate heat long after the fission process has been terminated. The used fuel has to be cooled in pools of circulating water for several years because if that heat is not removed as quickly as it is produced, the fuel will overheat and will damage itself. Radioactive gases, vapors, and aerosols will escape into the atmosphere or into the pool water. The second family of radioactive waste materials are the transuranic, so-called because they are heavier than uranium. Plutonium is the most famous of the transuranic elements because it is the primary explosive used in the nuclear arsenals of the world. When a non-fissile uranium atom is struck by a neutron, it doesn't split. It absorbs the neutron, becomes heavier, and turns into an atom of plutonium, or neptunium, or americium, or curium, all of them heavier than uranium itself, and all of them extremely toxic, even more toxic than the fission products. The first nuclear reactors were built for the sole purpose of producing plutonium for bombs. Plutonium has a half-life of 24,000 years. That's how long it takes for half of the atoms to disintegrate. So the plutonium used in nuclear fuel can be used to make atomic bombs by any regime at any time for thousands of years into the future. Plutonium and the other actinides are also, as I mentioned, thousands of times more radiotoxic than most fission products. It's amazing how much plutonium is needed to destroy a city. It's just the size of a small grapefruit. The third family of radioactive materials, waste materials, are the activation products. When a non-radioactive atom in the core area of a reactor absorbs a stray neutron, it becomes radioactive. Ordinary hydrogen, for example, becomes radioactive tritium. The structural materials in the core area also become intensely radioactive because of neutron activation. Traces of cobalt-59 in the steel become intensely radioactive cobalt-60, emitting powerful gamma rays that pose a serious danger to workers. So the steel itself becomes radioactive. When nickel is activated and becomes radioactive, it has a half-life of 76,000 years. So all of these structural materials in the core area become long-lived radioactive waste. Nuclear power is the ultimate emblem of the throwaway society. We cannot recycle these materials. Even pipes and equipment far away from the core, like the boilers, which are also called steam generators, become permanently contaminated by fission products, transuranics, 
and activated corrosion products. At the Bruce Reactor Station in Ontario on the shore of Lake Huron, 128 steam generators will be discarded as radioactive waste, each of them weighing 100 tons. The contamination is carried there by water circulating through the primary cooling circuit. One of the most daunting aspects of the radioactive waste from nuclear power plants is the almost infinite time horizon. The pyramids of Egypt are only 5,000 years old, yet these radioactive poisons will remain dangerous for much longer periods of time than that. Although the radioactive rubble and contaminated materials from the decommissioning of nuclear reactors are a formidable burden to future generations, it's nothing compared with the irradiated nuclear fuel. The irradiated nuclear fuel, so-called high-level radioactive waste, is by far the biggest headache. Here is a list of 211 radioactive elements contained in 10-year-old used nuclear fuel. Some of the fission products are so short-lived that they disappear within seconds. Others last for years, decades, centuries, or even millions of years in a few cases. So all of these elements are inside the solid used fuel, and this list is by no means complete. Because radioactivity cannot be shut off, the heat generated by radioactive waste also cannot stop. If used fuel is buried underground after being out of the reactor for 70 years, it will still be generating heat as shown by the red color in this diagram. This is one of a series of graphics in the environmental assessment document for a proposed deep geological repository in Canada. The horizontal lines represent strata of rock. And here it is after 4,400 years. That heat has nowhere to go except into the rock. And so the rock heats up and becomes hotter and will not return to its ambient temperature until after about 50,000 years. The industry calls that 50,000 year period the thermal pulse. You know what a pulse is, right? It's like a little blip on a radar screen, just a momentary thing, a flash in the pan. And that's because 50,000 years is just that, a very brief flash in the pan compared with the millions of years of danger represented by the toxicity of the used fuel. This graph is taken from a Royal Commission report on nuclear energy in Ontario. It indicates that just one year's worth of used fuel from a single reactor after one year of being out of the reactor is able in principle to contaminate all the water in Lake Superior, making it all unsuitable for drinking by exceeding the contamination level. The red line indicates the toxicity of the fission products by toxicity, I mean what happens when you get these things inside your body. While the blue line is the toxicity of all the radioactive waste materials combined, you notice that after about a thousand years, um, the, the blue line departs from the red line, and that's because the transuranics, the actinides, become the most toxic materials in the spent fuel. Now, the industry wants to bury this waste in a deep geological repository, seal it up, and abandon it there forever. But after abandonment, amnesia sets in. Future generations will not know what this stuff is or how to deal with it. If it begins to leak out into the groundwater, the surface waters, or the atmosphere, the OECD, Nuclear Energy Agency, is now saying that we have to store records for future generations. A small but growing number of people are proposing another approach called rolling stewardship. This is predicated on the realization that we do not actually have a solution to this problem. And the radioactive waste has to be looked after and packaged and repackaged to safeguard the environment and human health uh, as we go forward through the centuries. Perhaps the waste, remember that these waste materials are only about 80 years old. In the next couple of centuries, we may discover a real solution. We may be able to figure out a way of actually destroying these waste or rendering them harmless. In the meantime, the important thing is not to abandon them, but to keep them out of the environment. And the best way to do that is to keep an eye on it and make sure that people are ready to make repairs. Thank you very much.